What a privilege for me to be with you in Seoul, although I'm sorry I'm not with you in person. I've had the privilege of speaking at Sarang Church in California, have many Korean friends here, and I've twice been to Seoul itself, but what a privilege. Above all, because I admire the Korean church for your passion for prayer, for your passion for global mission, and for the way the church has grown, even as Korea has developed in the modern world, which is unusual. I would love to give a full picture of the opportunities and challenges facing the church of Jesus in the 21st century, but we haven't time. So I want to focus on one great challenge, the growth of an aggressive, supernaturally powerful secularism, which at its heart has an absolute hatred for God and a hatred for Jesus. Let me make five quick points if I can. First, remember the grand tasks facing the church in the 21st century. First, we must prepare the global south. The gospel is exploding in the world, but mostly in the global south. But much of the global south is pre-modern. And what is done in the church in the modern world is modernity, the modern world. So we need to prepare the global south with a strong discipleship that will be able to face the challenges of the arrival of the modern world. Secondly, we need to win back the advanced modern world and above all, the Western world. The Western world was rooted in the Jewish and Christian faiths, but secularism has overwhelmed the Western world so that the Christian faith now is marginal and on the sideline. Thirdly, we need to contribute to the human future. We're at an incredible moment in terms of transhumanism and ultra-intelligence. And it's tragic how few Christians are in the heart of the debate, which is going to shape the world for centuries. We need to be there. Secondly, we need to face up to our contribution to the rise of our greatest opp opposition. There have always been atheists in the world. We have atheists in the Bible, Psalm 14, and so on. But today we have, growing up in Europe, an aggressive, continent-sized secularism now beginning to sweep the world, the like of which the world has never seen. It is a parasite on our best and a protest against our worst. And there are three movements behind it we need to recognize. First, there are those who say, we don't want God. Where you've had in Europe established churches where the church and state have been together and they've both been oppressive, the revolutionary forces have thrown off both. In the French Revolution, for example, they cried, we'll never be free until we strangle the last king with the guts of the last priest. And there's a radical left hatred of God ever since. The second movement is those who say, not we don't want God, but we don't need God. With all of modern science and technology and capitalism and prosperity, we can live happily without any need of religion and any need of God. And the more prosperous parts of the world get, the less religious they become. The third movement is those who say, we can replace God. That, of course, goes back to the Garden of Eden and the temptation by the evil one. But with the rise of DNA and biogenetics, we have a new round of human beings thinking they can play God. There's a book, for example, called Homo Deus, Man 
as God by a Jewish atheist living in Jerusalem. And he says, science will do better than the Old Testament God. And we are about to be gods on planet Earth. So we should understand secularism is not just a dismissal of God. There's a supernatural hatred of God at the very heart of it. Thirdly, out of this have grown three specifically anti-God revolutions, which are facing us as Christians. The first grows out of theological liberalism or revisionism. I won't mention much about that. For 200 years, the Orthodox and the Evangelicals have resisted theological liberalism magnificently. But the second anti-God religion is the sexual revolution. People think that goes back to the 1960s and Playboy magazine and the invention of the pill and so on. But in fact, it goes back to the French Revolution and the same place as the political revolution came. And if you know the architects of the sexual revolution, they say quite clearly, they will never win until they overcome two enemies. One, parents, that's why they want sex education at ages three and four to rule out the place of parents. But secondly, the church. And they know that we are the alternative to their dangerous ideas. The third revolution is what's now called cultural Marxism. You know classical Marxism, which of course is most powerful, just south of you in China with Maoism and Marxism. But cultural Marxism is what swept Europe and much of America and is really the greatest danger in the advanced modern world. It analyzes power structures, looks at oppressors and then victims, and it uses victims in its attempt as a revolutionary force to overthrow the status quo. And you have women's studies and race studies and queer studies and fat studies and so on. And put them all together, you see the greatest challenge to the Christian faith, a total alternative way of life, a total alternative worldview. And openly, it's taking on the church. And in much of the West, sadly, it is now dominating. Fourthly, we need to wrestle with the distortions of faith in the advanced modern world. Not all the challenges we face come from ideas. The modern world itself has a subtle way of shaping us, often without realizing it. And to resist it, you need to recognize it. Let me mention three things that have nothing to do with ideas, and yet are deeply damaging to faith. And I'm sure some of these are beginning to come in in Korea too. First, the modern world shifts us from authority to preference. Take consumerism. We have so many choices today. From the foods we eat, to the clothes we wear, to the cars we drive. Everything is a matter of your choice, your preference, what you feel like today, and so on. And that comes into everything, including worship, including theology. And more and more you have people rejecting part of Scripture because they like this bit, not that bit. They loved love, not law. One man said to me, hell? Hell no. We all want love, but he didn't want judgment. And you can see that much of the modern church is riddled with a preference mentality that picks and chooses what it wants and throws out what it doesn't want. And of course, that's deadly to lordship and to discipleship. Take a second distortion. The modern world shifts us from an integrated faith to a fragmented faith. Jesus is Lord everywhere. 
But in our modern world, with so much mobility in cars and driving, we're strung out. Many years ago, I taught an adult class at President Reagan's church in Los Angeles. And I asked them, how many miles did they drive to come to church? And many said 75 miles, 50 miles. They come to church, they go to work, they go to a sports game, they go to the beach. Los Angeles is a huge city, like Seoul. And it was in that context that a critic said, the Christian faith has become privately engaging, publicly relevant. It works here, but not there. It means everything at home, but not at work. The Christian faith had become fragmented rather than integrated. And of course, that again is deadly to the Lordship of Christ and discipleship. Or take a third example. Our modern world shifts us slowly from the supernatural worldview to a secular worldview. We live in a world without windows. What's real? What we can touch, taste, see, weigh, measure, calculate. Now we look in the Bible and we look down through much of history. The unseen world was not unreal. In fact, the seen world was less real than the unseen world, not only for believers, but for non-believers too. The unseen was very real. But in our modern world, it's the seen world that's real and everything else is unreal. And slowly, there are many Christians in the West who are functional atheists. They're atheists unawares. Their worldview doesn't really include the supernatural. Now, thank God you and Korea haven't gone that way. But that will probably be the temptation of the future. The material world, prosperity, money, power, growth, all the things that are this side of the ceiling become real. And the church is strong in all of those. But slowly, it loses touch with the supernatural world. The fifth and last point. We need to make sure we have the needed tools to grapple with the modern world. Again, let me mention quickly three. First, and very obviously, spiritual warfare. Now, as I said, I admire Korean prayer and your passion for prayer. So you're known for that worldwide, and even Koreans in the West have a much greater practice of prayer than many Western Christians. But the challenge is to keep that, because the modern secular world slowly drowns it out. And it's the secular things of this world that become more real, and so on. And so I would expect the Korean churches to face that temptation, to grow more and more materialistic, and to be concerned with their numbers and their money and all things like that, rather than spiritual power from the supernatural world. Secondly, you need the history of ideas. Many people just confront ideas as they come across their path. But we need to understand the ancestry, the family tree, where ideas come from, and then you really understand the danger of them in a profound way. I mentioned the sexual revolution. When you see where it goes back to in the French Revolution, you realize what a tremendous challenge it will be. But we need to understand the history of ideas to really engage prophetically with the ideas of our time. And the third and last thing I'll mention as a tool is cultural analysis. As I said, the danger isn't just ideas. We need to know how cars and television and radio and social media and all sorts of things affect us. For example, time. Everyone in the advanced modern world lives with what's called fast life, 24-7 pressure. Where does that come from? There's no philosopher or psychologist or social scientist behind it. It comes from clocks and watches. It's said that the clock invented in Europe around 1300 is the most powerful tool from Europe. But of course, it was when clocks were coordinated in the 19th century. But now with atomic time, and we're living under this incredible pressure. 
And it leads only, not only to our time, but to our psychology. They tell us we're on the wrong side of history. We have the idea we've got to be relevant all the time. The latest is greatest and so on. All of that comes from the pressure of clocks. Now to be in the world, but not of it, we have to recognize the world and we need the tools to be able to do so. So let me summarize this for your prayer. As you look out on the 21st century, the Christian faith is the largest faith on the earth. But in more and more parts of the advanced modern world, we're not doing well. The central issue today is faithfulness. I don't know if you know the name of the great English Christian leader, John Stott. He died a few years ago in his 90s. I visited him on his deathbed, and I was praying for him, and I asked him, he was a great friend, I said, John, how do you want me to pray for you? In a barely audible whisper, he said, pray that I may be faithful to Jesus to my last breath. Faithfulness is a challenge when things are going well. We rely on power and numbers and prosperity and efficiency and growth and all these things, which often are purely human. We need to be faithful rather than successful. Faithfulness, of course, means everything when things are not going well. And in more and more parts of the world, we Christians are the most persecuted faith on the earth. And our challenge is to be faithful to our Lord. So I would say to you with great love, God is greater than all. He can be trusted in all situations. Have faith in God. Have no fear. By God's grace, let's seize the opportunities of this century. And let's face the challenges of this century and show that in Jesus, the power of the good news, the best news ever, is greater than any challenge and opposition that we will come across. The Lord be with you. Thanks for having me.